but that was cute. I mean, it, it really wasn't anything de theologically, but it was showing just kind of what goes on. If you are here for the first time since we started a couple weeks, uh, last week, if you were here last week, I want to kind of let you know where we are and let you know where we're going in this sermon series. Uh, we have started a new sermon series entitled Ten Men from the Bible. And this is by Max Lucado. It's a study by Max Lucado. And basically we're looking at ten different men from the Bible and looking at some of their struggles and, and what they went through and how they responded to those struggles and, and how God responded to them. And last week, if you were here, you remember we talked about who? Noah. Noah. Good. We talked about Noah. We know the story of Noah and how Noah uh, was told by God, I need you to build an ark. And I need you to build an ark so that you will be safe from the flood. And we need you to take your family. We need you to take two of each animal to go on this ark. Because the world, is, the earth is going to be destroyed by this flood. And we need you to be safe. And so God told Noah to do that. And Noah took his family. He took the animals on the ark. And while it looked good and everything, that Noah was safe and he was protected, we understand that Noah did have some problems and some struggles with the flood. The main struggle Noah had was that Noah, every time he looked out the window of the ark, he saw nothing but water. To, to all directions of Noah, there was nothing but water. He could see no land. And while that was a problem in itself, the main problem, or one of the big problems, was the fact that Noah, as he looked out the window and saw nothing but water, what he did see was places where he remembered being with friends, with those he laughed with, with those he talked with. And each and every day, for 40 days, Noah looked out the window and all he could see was water. And there must have been that time in Noah's mind where he thought, God, when will this stop? How long do we have to go on through this? And so there was one day when Noah decided to uh, let out a dove. He did. The dove came back. And you remember what he had in his mouth? A leaf, an olive leaf. That's exactly right, an olive leaf. And this was... You know, symbolic because not only was it just an olive leaf, but it was also a symbol that God had not forgotten Noah. And this was very important to Noah, to know that even though the water was all around him, even though he was out on the water for 40 days, God had not forgotten him. And, and we understand that in our situations in life where we may look around and see nothing but pain and suffering and hurting, one thing we can remember for a fact is that God does not forget us. God knows our needs and God knows where we are in life and, and how He can help us. And that brings us to tonight. We're looking at another guy in the Bible, another man in the Bible. And I'm going to share a phrase with you and you're going to finish it out. And I know you're going to do this because it's a very easy phrase. And here it is. You must have the patience of Job. And people say, I don't want the patience of Job. Because Job had to go through a lot when he was struggling, and when he was hurting. We know the story of Job. We've heard it many times before. The story of Job goes like this. Now this is covered throughout the book of Job. If we want to see, it's a whole book basically about his struggles. But this is kind of how the book of Job goes. Job was a righteous person. Job was a person who, who trusted God and loved God and, and did everything he could for God. And one day Satan was roaming around, the Bible tells us, and God asked him what he was doing. And Satan said, I'm looking for people, basically, to do things, to to hurt, to harm. And God said, well, have you tried my servant Job? And uh, Satan said, no. So God said, you can go and you can do things, you know, with Job, but you can't hurt him. And so Satan said, okay. Now, everything that happened to Job happened in one day. Now, that's, that's pretty amazing, really, when we think about it. Everything that happened to Job happened in one day. For example, um, Job found out through messengers that Job's animals, all that he had, had been destroyed. He found out that all the family he had had been destroyed. His children. He found out that his business, basically, had been destroyed. And all this happened in one day. Now, we know people probably that have dealt with things that Job has dealt with. I mean, we know people who have lost their businesses or lost their jobs or careers. We know people who have lost loved ones or children or family. 
We know people who have lost materialistic things and devastated. We don't. All we got to do is think about this weekend. I mean, there have been people who have lost lives, they've lost family, they've lost material things, they've lost houses, they've lost a lot of stuff. And, and so they've experienced what Job has experienced, but never has anybody that I know of have, has experienced or anybody will experience all of these things in one day as Job did. Losing his family, losing his business, losing animals. And if that wasn't enough, after all this happened, Job noticed these sores that were coming on his body. And these sores were painful. And these sores hurt Job. And the Bible tells us that Job took broken pottery and scraped these sores so that they would not hurt him. So he could try to find some relief from what was taking place. You see, Satan did so many things to Job and, and brought about so many traumatic events in Job's life that he struggled. Even though he was a man who, who trusted God and, and knew about God, he still struggled. Now if we look at the book of Job, we can break it down into three different parts. The first part of the book of Job is, a, is in fact the sharing of the events that happened in Job's life, all the terrible things that took place. The second part of the book of Job is Job getting advice from different people. The third part is Job's conversation with God. And in just a minute, we're going to focus on that because that is so important as we deal with God amidst tragedies in our lives. But we see the events that took place in Job's life, and then we see Job getting advice. Now, you would think from your spouse you would get good advice. I would hope. You can look around at your spouse and see if that might be the case. Especially when things are going tough. When things are difficult. You know, hang in there. It'll get better. You know, keep your head up. People have it worse than you. All these good things to help you get through it. <clears throat> but that's not what Job's wife said. Job's wife's advice was simply this. Curse God and die. Wow. Job, I know things are tough, but you know what? It would be better if you're just dead. Job probably thinking, really? That's why you called me in the kitchen to give me that piece of advice? I mean, she was like, Job, nothing's going to be better. It would be better off if you were dead. I mean, look at what all's happened. You've lost everything you've got. You're in pain day after day, hurting from these sores. Job, why don't you just curse God and die? So Job leaves his wife thinking, well, the one support I thought I had, I don't have. Well, never fear, because you get other advice from your friends. <clears throat> now, Job's friends came after they heard about Job struggling. They were good friends with Job, and they wanted to help Job, and so they traveled to where Job was. And they found Job, and they decided what we need to do is we just need to sit with Job in the midst of his ashes, so to speak. In other words, sit with him in his struggles. And you know what? That's not a bad idea. That's some good advice that whoever gave his friends. Was, why don't you just sit with Job? Why don't you just let him feel your presence? Why don't you just let him know we're here for you, we'll take care of you, whatever you need, we're here. Now, let me tell you, if Job's friends would have done nothing but sit with him quietly, that would have been good. But you know, that's not what they wanted to do. After about seven days, they decided, no, we've we got to give him some advice. We travel. So I've got to say something. You know, we may know people that do that. We, we go somewhere where someone's hurting, and <clears throat> you know, we just can't sit with them. We've got to give them advice. And sometimes it's better just to sit. But Job's friends give him some advice. And his wife, their advice is not, we're here for you, we've got you. We've got you covered if you need anything. You know, let us know what you need. Can we mow your grass that you had before it was taken away from you? You know, can we do anything to help you? That's not their advice. Their advice is simply this. Well, you know, Job, since God has nothing to do with evil, and all these bad things are happening to you, then it's pretty obvious to us what's taking place. 
because of something you've done in your life, God's punishing you. And so really, Job, you brought this on yourself. Now in Job's mind, he's probably thinking, now, I've tried to be as good as I can in my relationship with God. I've tried to walk with Him the best I can. And here are these guys telling me that it's because I'm such a bad person that God's punishing me by allowing this to happen. And so Job hears this day after day. He hears from each one of these guys and he responds to them. And each one of them tells him the same thing until Job says, you know what, enough. Be quiet. Just, just stop talking. And Job is through with his friends. Well, there's another one. A man by the name of Elihu who was a minister. He was a, a, a leader. And he basically told Job some pretty good advice. And this is what he told Job. He said, Job, sometimes God allows things to happen to bring people back to God. I don't disagree with that. I think there are times when things happen and, and the only thing that can happen out of that is we turn back to God and trust Him more and... and just come closer to God. So that's not a bad bit of advice that Elihu gave him. But you know, Job wasn't happy with that. Job decided, okay, I've got advice from my wife, which really we're not even going to deal with. So I've got advice from friends, which they weren't any help at all. Now I've got this advice from Elihu, which is pretty good advice. But you know what? I think it's time that I talk to God myself. And so what we have is we have Job confronting God. <clears throat> now you may have wanted to confront God yourself. You may have confronted God yourself. You may have decided that it would be best if you shared it exactly with God how God doesn't know what He's doing in life. I wonder how many times we've thought about that. You know, God, you really just, I, I really wonder if you even know what you're doing. Allowing this stuff to happen. You know, allowing bad things to happen to good people. Allowing hurricanes, allowing storms, allowing all this devastation. God, do you even know what you're doing? And so, verse after verse, Job confronts God. I think it's like six chapters, Job confront, confronts God about what God is doing or what God is not doing or, or how God needs to change things or how God needs to do things differently so that things will be better for Job. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever thought, what would it be like if God actually came face to face with me and answered my life question? What if God were to say, you know what, you're right. It's time for me to talk to you about your questions. I don't know about you, but that kind of scares me. I don't know that I want to deal with that. You know, when I was growing up, and I don't know about the young people today, when I was growing up, if there's one thing I didn't want to do, it was deal with my mom. I could deal with my dad. He didn't say a lot. And my mom always said, his name was Joe, she said, Joe, why don't you talk to the kids? And he would say, kids, you need to straighten up. We would say, okay, Dad. I would much rather hear that than my mom get involved. I'm like, Mom, your dad's got it. Don't worry about it. Dad's got it. Because I didn't want to hear the wrath of my mom. You know, words from mom just came out stronger than they did Dad. You know, I knew my mom loved me, but it sounded like she hated me. And it was scary to hear those things that she would say sometimes. She loved me. I knew she loved me. She just did it a different way than my dad did. And it was scary sometimes what I heard. But I was thinking as I did this study tonight about Job, what would it really be like if I really wanted God to answer my why question? God, why did you allow this to happen to me? God, why did you allow this not to happen to me? Think about it. What would happen if God came face to face with you and answered your why questions? 
Well, Job didn't think about that. All Job knew was, I need to confront God, and I need to tell God that things aren't going my way, and, and I don't know that He really understands this, and I really need to share my heart with God. And I really need to sort of set God straight. In other words, I think I know more about God than God knows about God. And God listened. God didn't turn His back on Job, but God listened. But there came a point in that conversation where God basically said, Enough's enough. Job, it's time for you to listen to me. Job, it's time for you to understand I am God and you are not. And Job, you really need to pay attention. You see, there came a point when God had to confront Job. And folks, in our lives as we grow and as we walk with God, there will come times when, when we feel like we need to confront God about things. And it's at that point when God will confront us and we will feel it and we will understand it. And I believe God does this so that we'll come back to Him and understand He's God and we're not. You see, God's conversation with Job, if you want to call it a conversation, it wasn't, in, it wasn't meant to teach Job anything. God's conversation with Job was meant to stun Job and to wake him back up. It wasn't meant to enlighten Job and help Job learn more. It was basically meant to make Job wake up and understand who God was. Basically, God's conversation with Job was pretty clear. And his intent was clear. And here's what God wanted Job to understand. Job, when you can answer the simple questions of creation, then you can talk with me about the pain and suffering you're dealing with. You see, while we might want to challenge God and about how He's allowed things to happen, we have to understand who God is. You see, we serve a God who put everything into place. We can go back to the very beginning of time and, and understand that we will find the Creator in the very beginning of time. We can, we can talk about how the world was created. We can talk about where we came from. We can talk about how life got its start. But if we want to go all the way back to it, it doesn't matter what we say because ultimately it goes back to God and He has always been. God said, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. In other words, there has never been a time when God has not been. And when we get to that point, when we get to where we're equal with God, then we can begin to dicker with God. And we can say, you know what, God? This is what I think needs to happen. But until, until that point, which will never happen, we just need to understand that God is God. And we are not. So God begins to confront Job. God begins to talk to Job. God begins to help Job understand that Job needs to listen to God. That Job needs to understand he can't compete with God. And that God really doesn't have to give him an answer for what's happening. Because God is God. So how do we respond? How do we respond when we feel God speak to us? Well, Job shows us his response. I invite you to listen to Job chapter 40, verses 4 and 5. This is Job's response to God the Creator. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Basically, Job is humble in his conversation with God. He says, God, you know you're right. You're the creator, I'm not. God, you know you're right. You, you've done everything. You've given us everything. And God, really, I, I don't have a right. I don't have a right to complain and, and to try to tell you how to do your job and things like that. So God, I've done that one time and, and I'm not doing it anymore. God, I'm being quiet. And 
I'm just going to listen. I'm going to wait on you. You know what that's called? That's called maturing in Christ. It's called wisdom when we get to the point in our lives when we don't feel like we have to confront God about things, but we get to the point where we be still and know that He is God. That's an amazing place. It's an amazing place to understand where we are and where God is. But folks, we're going to get a lot of advice like Job did. We're going to get people to say, Job, you know what? You deserve better than this. You know what, Job? God has done you wrong. You know what, Job? I don't know that I would trust God with my life if He allowed this to happen to me. But folks, we have got to get to the point where when times are tough, we allow God to be God. And we say, God, you know what? I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but the thing I do know is this. You're God. I'm not. You know what's best. I don't. And I just place it in your hands. That's where Job got in his conversation with God. If you read the rest of the story, you understand that Job got better. He not only got back what he lost, but he got it back twice, twofold. And God blessed him again. Not because he deserved it, but because he's God. And he chose to do that. See, we don't know what we're going to face each day. We don't know what's going to happen. But the thing we do know is this. The same God who, who allowed Job to bend his frustration and then set him straight in his relationship with him is the same God we serve. And the same God that Job said, you are my creator and I'll be quiet and listen. It's the same God that wants to speak to us in his still small voice and let us know you've not been forgotten. But I love you and I'll always be with you. No matter what happens, would you pray with me?